Hi, everybody. Thank you for the intro. Um, my name is Stephen Huang. I'm the head of diversity and inclusion at CultureAmp. CultureAmp is an employee feedback platform, and we have a DNI product. So I have a really fun job as the head of diversity and inclusion. I build diversity and inclusion internally, and I also manage our DNI product externally to our 1,700 customers globally. And in my experience, I've gotten a really good insight into how successful HR and DNI teams operate. Those that know me well know that I'm always pushing people to experiment and try new methods. So I'm here today to tell you about one of these methods. It's called the fishbowl, specifically a fishbowl panel. And it's a new way to facilitate difficult conversations. I'll tell you what they're all about, what to expect, um, and how to run one as well. So a traditional panel is what this room is set up for, and it's what we're seeing really out in the break room. It's where you have speakers designated by these triangles in the front of the room, and you have your audience members represented by these squares listening in. There's nothing wrong with traditional panels. I like being on panels myself. I've sat in on hundreds of panels in my career, as many of you have as well. And they're a great way to learn a new skill, to hear from experts on their craft. I've learned how to implement a diversity recruiting strategy. I've learned how to launch ERGs in a global context. They're great for that. But to teach diversity and inclusion these days, we often have to get people to question their privilege. Yeah. <laughs> we have to get people to examine a dark part of society and how they and their role kind of fits in with that. And in order to do that, we need a different method. And that's really where the fishbowl panel shines. So in a fishbowl panel, right away, people walk into the room and they, they're gonna get an immediate signal that this is a different kind of panel. Because the speakers aren't up front, they're actually in the center of the room, facing each other. And the audience members are in concentric circles, all looking inside. Now, the last time I did this was at Culture First Global Conference, and there were 300 people in the room. <laughs> that was aggressive. <laughs> the fire marshal was not impressed with me. Um, I would not recommend doing 300 people. I would really recommend 30 to 50 people to start to make sure it's an intimate experience. There are some more key differences in a fishbowl that I want to tell you about. The first is that the moderator is going to share a set of agreed upon rules. And one of those rules is really important. It's that speakers speak from personal experience, not expertise. It's very tempting to speak from your personal, uh, sorry, to speak from your expertise, to cite research, um, to, to tout your company's accomplishments, but that's actually not what we're going for in a fishbowl. We actually want people to speak from personal experience um, and, and to share kind of difficult and vulnerable moments in their life. Another key difference is that, well, you'll have two microphones in the room. One microphone should not leave the moderator's hands. You don't know what conversation is going to come up, and you want to make sure you're able to interject or lightly coach someone, say, if they're speaking from their expertise and not their personal experience. The other microphone is passed from speaker to speaker in a concept called mutual invitation. So um, if Jessie were to speak and share her experiences on a fishbowl, which she did with me, when she's done speaking, she's going to pass the microphone to someone uh, in the circle. And that person can decide to accept and speak, or they can decide to pass. The concept of mutual invitation is akin to giving consent in a conversation in what is often a difficult uh, and sensitive to topic. One of the kickers in the fishbowl is that one of those seats in the center of the room for the speakers is left open. It's called the concept of an open seat. The open seat is impactful because audience members can decide to take that seat and share a point of view or perspective that they don't feel is being represented by the other people in the circle. This turns you all into passive listeners, into actual active participants in this conversation. In a fishbowl, you're going to get really a variety of different experiences and perspectives, and that's really what adds to the flavor and the, dyna the dynamic of a fishbowl panel. And even when that seat's not really taken by anyone, I've noticed that 
you're going to have a more inclusive conversation because that open seat can be filled by anyone and everyone. So people are kind of mindful of the fact that there's someone who's not in this circle that we can't ignore. And lastly, this is kind of a personal tip for me. Speakers should not be given the questions ahead of time. Frankly, because they're speaking from personal experience, not expertise, they really have nothing to prepare anyway. And with the open seat and active participation from audience members, you really don't know where this conversation is going to go. Luckily, I had an experienced co-facilitator when I ran it with me. But as a facilitator, your job is really to guide the conversation and create a pathway for it to go. You don't need to start by talking about race. It'll usually get there, just a side note. Um, some of you are like, OK, you, you get it. You've probably sat in on some. And some of you are like, I don't get it. Um, let me explain to you kind of how the, the content is a little bit different. So I believe tomorrow or the day after is International Pronouns Day. Does anyone know that? It's OK if you didn't. It's actually the first International Pronouns Day. So I'm learning about it too. Um, if I was on a panel and I was to speak about transgender rights, I would tell you that transgender children that get to use their chosen name are going to see a 71% less um, likelihood of having severe depression and a 65% chance, reduced chance of a suicide attempt. But if I was on a fishbowl panel, I'd probably tell you that two weeks ago, I was at a client site, um, which was a children's hospital in the South. And at this children's hospital, they are really sick and tired of seeing trans children show up with self-inflicted gunshot wounds to the head. And it is really heartbreaking for them to have to hide some of this stuff from the state government because it affects their ability to get state grant funding. But by including gender pronouns in your email signatures and your LinkedIn profiles and your business cards, we can begin to normalize different gender pronouns and we can advocate for transgender rights in that way. Which method do you think would be more impactful? I can tell you it was the latter. And everyone in my company has gender pronouns all over the place, which is great. That's kind of the, the way that the content shifts. We're speaking from personal experiences. I'm not going to cite any research or expertise. This is Gabe Wilson. He is one of the tech um, experts when it comes to leading fishbowl panels. He's a Zen Buddhist. Um, you should follow him. He's, he's based in Utah. Um, and Gabe will tell you that a fishbowl panel is not an appropriate substitute all of the time for a traditional panel. As I mentioned, traditional panels are a great way to hear from experts about their craft or to teach someone a new skill, much like I'm doing upstage right now on a solo talk. But in instances where emotional connection is really more critical to progress than a debate about what's right or wrong, we would both implore you to please think about using a fishbowl panel format in your next DNI gathering. It really unlocks a new pathway for people to feel and experience what it's like to be in a marginalized group. I think there was one more thing I wanted to say about fishbowl panels, but I can't think of it. So I'll end there. Thank you so much for your time. My name is Stephen Huang. Um, my contact information is right here. You can find me on LinkedIn, and that's where I'm going to put the slides as well. Thank you.